Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, Kids in Mind, a seminar series to help families and give practical strategies um, about how to support kids uh, in the pandemic. Uh, on our Wednesday nights, we talk about real practical strategies and uh, engage in families in a dynamic way with health experts um, uh, and to answer all of your questions. And the, in the first session, we had Leanne Tor speak about how to have positive and fun communication with kids. Um, in the second session, we had um, Fiona Comfort talk about uh, how grandparents can connect from afar. And today, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Associate Professor Nat Natalie Munro and Dr. Rebecca Sutherland, who are both speech pathologists with expertise in child development, autism, developmental language disorder, uh, with decades of experience in providing services, as well as um, cutting edge research. Um, so, it's, so I'd like to uh, welcome them both. Welcome, Natalie and Rebecca. Hey. Thanks for coming today. Um, maybe, Natalie, if you could just start by giving us a little bit of your background to, for, for everyone. Oh, okay. Um, I'm an associate professor at Sydney University, and um, I love talking about child language and uh, development and disorders. And yeah, I've worked clinically as well. Um, and yeah, that's about me. I've got three kids at home, you know, love the joy of home learning and waiting, looking forward to the school holiday break. Thanks, Nat. And Rebecca, hi. Thanks, Adam. Um, uh, like Nat, I'm a lecturer at Sydney University and at the University of Canberra, and I've got um, a lot of years behind me working particularly in autism clinically, um, diagnosing autism and working with young kids and school-age kids. And like Nat, I also have the joy of homeschooling a daughter as well at the moment okay. when they get back to school. Thanks very much. Now, um, if you have any questions throughout the series, just uh, you can post the question in the chat. The chat will um, appear uh, to the panelists, but it won't appear to all the audience. So you don't have to be worried about what other people might think of the question. Um, we try to answer just about every question that's posted and we'll endeavor to do that tonight. And um, we'll start the uh, seminar by asking yourself, Natalie, um, there's been a, a lot of talk about kids being at home and uh, concerns about language development and communication development and whether COVID might be having a, um, uh, an impact on, we've just got a bit of a, yeah, a yep. bit of a, yeah, so having a negative impact on kids' development. Um, so Natalie, could you talk through the evidence that exists at the moment around the impact of homeschooling and, and language development? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the impact is kind of emerging, isn't it? You know, it depends on uh, which country we're looking at and the experiences of, of that. But I, I have been looking at some um, evidence from England and that last year's um, lockdowns over there in the UK and the Education Endowment Foundation um, conducted a survey um, of, you know, schools across England, over 50,000 kind of students involved. And they were looking at pretty much come to the conclusion that lockdown was depriving our young kids of social contact uh, and, and experience that we normally would take for granted, you know, that kind of experiential learning, which is all really crucial for vocabulary development and social development. Um, they found that in their survey, 96% of schools were concerned um, about their students' speech and language development, um, and that about three quarters of the students that came back to school in the, from that following year needed extra speech and language support. Um, so, so there's certainly, um, uh, you know, concern both in the parenting community and the school community that, um, you know, the less contact with grandparents, the social distancing aspects, the lack of play dates or less frequency of um, play dates and that less exposure to quality kind of, you know, group interactions kind of gives us reduced opportunities for conversation and everyday kind of um, vocabulary learning. Right. And, and in terms of the, uh, the delays, are there any specific delays that you're particularly worried about or that you think that parents should be aware of in terms of the isolation? Yeah, I think it's it's um, across the board for listening and speaking skills because we know that listening and speaking skills, um, broadly speaking, are associated with better self-esteem, um, better confidence, um, better academic outcome, uh, better better literacy development, um, and and employability as you know as kids get older. So I kind of think it's kind of broadly speaking, it's both comprehension skills, listening and and speaking skills that um, are, are being impacted. So if that's the case, what are some of the things that families and parents can do um, during homeschooling and 
um, to promote language and communication? Um, lots, because parents know their kids best. Um, and and we would talk, we've been talking about, you know, have, having active kind of conversations with kids and chatting with our kids at home um, and, and varying up that kind of vocabulary, um, reading to your kids, to even just talking about the pictures in a picture, in a picture book, um, because the vocabulary in a picture book is, is different to the vocabulary that you would have just like in the daily routine of, you know, doing the laundry or, you know, eating dinner time. Um, uh, having experiences both in and inside and outside um, the house, you know, we can we can do that. We've got um, lots of opportunities. Asking kids questions um, and allowing them to kind of comment as well, and responding, really responding and listening to um, when the child does, you know, initiate a conversation or an observation. Um, I think all of that really um, responding to the kids interest all of those kind of strategies are really kind of helpful they don't they might be underplayed or you might not think that you know that's a real of real value but it really does promote language development and, and um, you know we know that um, it, it's something important for us to do take take note and take um, aware of your surroundings um, and I was just listening to my girl the other day and we heard the, you know, the wind, the change in weather. And it, it was like the wind was howling like through the door. And I was like, ooh, you know. <laughs> so I said to her, oh, do you hear that wind howl? And she was just looked at me and you know, we were like going, ooh, you know, and howling. And then all of a sudden I was talking to her about um, what else howls, you know, what you know, wolves howl and, you know, dogs howl. And so we're running around the house going, ooh, you know. <laughs> because <laughs> she got scared of the wind so you know it's just opportunities like that now she knows the word the verb howling right so yeah so i mean part of it is language development what are, and vocab increasing vocab is sort of what you're referring to there yeah i think leanne also sort of raised some of that stuff in the first seminar what are the what are the milestones that we sort of look out for in young children when as they're developing is that for me or for Beck? Whatever. Beck you talk about that, Nat. <laughs> well, okay. So, um, well, I mean, communication starts from day one with our babies, right? Um, the smiles, the gurgles, the cooing, babbling by six months of age. You know, it's all communicate. It's all communication. And uh, first words around 12 months of age. That's really exciting. By about 18 months, kids have an average of about 50 words. Um, what else? Um, by two years, they have two word combinations and they probably have a vocabulary around 200, 300 words, some, some two-year-olds, because there is wide variation in language development. Um, they can understand uh, requests like mummy up, um, or they might even say, you know, mummy up. They can say, make comments like oh, big ball. Um, what else can they do? They can... Um, uh, request objects, you know, like more milk, you know. So two-year-olds are real, uh, real communicators. They can follow simple commands like "Where's your nose?" "Show, show me mummy's tummy," um, and they probably about fifty percent of what they say can be understood by an unfamiliar listener, right? But then, you know, as they get older, um, two to three years of age, you know, maybe 75% of what they say can be understood by um, an unfamiliar listener. They start using simple sentences. Um, they might still have some speech errors, um, you know, things like maybe from two to three, like instead of saying look, they might say wook or spoon for uh, poon for spoon, you know, these kind of cute little errors around that age or, or like um, spaghetti might be, longer words like spaghetti might be getty. Um, you know, that, that's, that's okay at that, at that point. Um, but, you know, by four years of age, they're really talking in really, you know, more complex um, grammatical um, sentences. They use um, combination words like and and because. Mm -hmm. um, they can tell stories at four years of age. Um, they can retell um, events that have happened in their lives. And of course, you might not know this, and I looked this up the other day, but um, <laughs> kids, four-year-old kids, right, on average, they ask 107 questions in an hour, right? So the no. four-year-old, they do. Someone, how did someone count that? 
<laughs> so they can they ask like the what questions and the why you know that like, dad why but why you know that they because they, they're curious they're inquisitive right. you know um when is still hard to answer four-year-olds find it hard to understand concepts of time so you know words like before and after are really tricky better to say first this then that you know rather than using words like before and after because they're tricky um and and really by four four and a half you know 100 percent of mostly 100% of what they're saying is understood by an unfamiliar listener. So, you know, um, the errors, there might be residual errors like, you know, R for W or um, things like that. But really, they're, they're quite complicated kind of beautiful beings. They can follow instructions quite well, like simple instructions, two-step instructions like wash your hands, I don't know, go put your dishes away. And they can also follow unfamiliar instructions like, um, I don't know, show me the monkey under the bed, right? Which might not be as familiar to them, but they can still understand those kind of instructions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so look, I mean, that's communication no in a nutshell. You made, <laughs> yeah, you have just given everyone a lecture on the fine details of, you know, early childhood development. Thank you very much. If you need an assessment. My pleasure. Uh, your pleasure. Um, <laughs> well, actually, this is, this is a, a really important issue because um, there is a great variation yeah. and... I know parents worry, um, you know, like we've, we've had kids in our own family that we're, you know, have, have been delayed and sort of, we're not sure when do we need to be worried. And in, you know, some of my friends, you know, they, they sort of make excuses sometimes and go, it, it'll come on and not, not having a, um, a sort of a clear understanding of when one should be concerned can lead to sort of longer problems. Mm -hmm. What, when, what um, when should parents, so maybe there's a there's something I need to intervene on or I need to act on. Beck. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take that one. That's a really good question, Adam, because you're exactly right. There is wide variation. Sometimes some children are a little bit slower out of the blocks and then they do catch up all by themselves. We know that children who are learning two languages might show um, little variations as well as they're consolidating two languages going on. But generally, there's a few things that sh should always be just a little bit worried about. So if your child loses language, if they're talking and then they're not talking, that's a huge, that's a red flag. So you definitely want to start to talk to somebody and just check that out because that's a bit unusual. If there's no words at all at 18 months or two years, that would be something to talk to someone about. So start with an early childhood nurse or start with a GP, maybe start with a speech pathologist, that's okay. But just get just get some information about that. Um, if your child is say three or four and grandma and grandpa still can't understand them at all, um, we'd be worried about that. So there's all these things that are, are normal for a while or typical for a while. It's typical to use one word for a while or it's typical to be hard to understand for a while. And then as you're getting older, this is when we might start to have a little bit of you know, just things to check out. And most of the time, you know, there won't be huge problems. It'll be things that, you know, maybe you can get a little bit of support for or some different um, ideas around stimulating language or some tips and tricks. Um, but sometimes it might be something that you need a little bit more help with from speech pathologists um, yeah. or you know, other clinicians. And the isolation makes, we're going to talk about this in social development in an upcoming webinar, but the isolation makes it a lot harder to see what other peers are doing comparatively, doesn't yeah. it? So um, a lot of parents may not be aware of wh wh where they expect, wh where their child is meant to be sort of performing if, in terms yeah. of communication. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you're right. It is, um, you know, seeing other kids at preschool or play group or in the park is nice sometimes just to get a bit of a gauge. Sometimes that can be unhelpful as well because sometimes there'll be, you know, one kid who's come out of the box really fast and, and your kid's doing their own pace and that can be stressful for parents as well. There are some really good resources around from Speech Pathology Australia about communication milestones that are really useful and we'll pop that in the chat for people to have a look at as well. Um, so that, that's probably a good way to have a look. So what, are, what do we know are the typical ranges and it's definitely a range. Um, parents can have a look at those as well. Okay, thanks, Beck. Um, now, now, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your research on late talking toddlers and preschoolers. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've studied and, uh, and your research field in general? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so late talking toddlers are, are toddlers that by definition probably aren't producing more than um, 50 words or saying 50 words or no two word combinations. And, and generally the parent has some concern about the child's vocabulary development um, because parental concern is a really valid indicator. Um, so, you know, we need to be really mindful of that. And actually um, when you um, look at parental concern and the agreement between early childhood educators and parental concern, they're pretty, if both, they're pretty both in agreement with each other if there is a problem. Um, so I've been working with some colleagues at University of Sydney and overseas as well in, in the US and um, in Hong Kong, working on um, how to boost children's vocabulary who are late to, who, for kids who are late to talk. Um, because we know that um, there's been some research that late talkers have an increase um, uh, um, well, increased um, tantrums, frequency of tantrums and the severity of the tantrums as well um, are higher uh, when they're late to talk. And you can kind of understand that from a frustration kind of perspective as well. But when you've got behaviour concerns and speech and vocabulary kind of concerns in tandem, then, you know, that's another, um, you know, double whammy kind of concern to, to you know, consider. Um, so we've been looking at some intervention studies um, where we select two to three words in, you know, in a 20 minute kind of session. Um, and we do it in kind of a play context. And so the words might be bus, um, go and I don't know, um, cup, right? And so in the, within that 20 minute session, we have um, a book reading or book kind of interaction, um, a toy play interaction uh, and some craft. Now craft with two year olds is always fun, um, but you can, <laughs> you can do stuff with them um, in, in a safe way as well. And, and while, the, while the child's looking, playing with the craft with you or you know, going through the toys and things, um, you, you want to say the words and say those, you know, those two, three words a lot, right? But the, the interesting thing is that if you vary the position of the word in the sentence, um, it really helps them identify the words that are necessary, like for vocabulary learning. So say, for example, I've got the word bus, I can have the word, um, I could say the bus is going down the road, right? Or I could say, um, uh, there's a bus. So the words at the bus is at the end of the word, or I could say bus, stop, stop bus. Right. right. So if you vary um, the, the sentences that you say and you, you use normal grammar, right. You don't break words up and put them in telegrammatic kind of speech, you use normal sentences and you can highlight them, you know, like make your voice louder or softer um, for the words. But if you, if you do this and you reduce the expectation that you have on the kid to talk, right? So you completely don't put any kind of pressure on them um, to produce the words, then, and, and you provide the stimulation of those words really frequently, then you, we are getting really good treatment outcomes with that. And we're actually kickstarting uh, their vocabulary, not only with the trained words, but also with words that they're learning in the um, ambient environment. So that's really exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm that really, sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, and so, and oh, sorry, Adam, I was going to say there's an article um, that um, one of that's a really useful a summary of that um, that banter speech have produced. And, and if we can put that in the chat, then people can have a look at that because it's a lovely summary of that work which originated in the US. Yep. All right. Thanks, Nat. Thank you. We've got Later. a comment here from uh, Carolina. She says that she has a boy that's seven years old and and a two-year-old boy, and they speak Spanish at home, and they sing a lot in Spanish and English. What, what do we know about, um, I guess, bilingual languages and, and exposure to it at a very young age? How does that influence development? Do you want me to take that one? or Whoever would like <laughs> to take that one. I'll... Well, and that will add to this, I'm sure. sure. I guess the first thing to say is do it. Most yeah. of the world is bilingual. <laughs> In Australia, in Anglo people who look like me, I only talk one language, but internationally, I'm an anomaly. I'm the weird one because I only have one language. And I think it's really important to encourage and really make sure that families who have the gift of more than one language in them or a home language that keeps them connected to their culture and their family, it's the language that the kids should learn. Don't be scared of using your home language. Even if children have language delay, we want them to learn a really good language that their parents know the best because the kids, if they've got that solid foundation in their first language, they will learn English. 
They will go to preschool, they'll go to school, they'll learn English. But what we want for them to is to have a really strong foundation in whatever language their parents are best in. So if, if mum and dad's English isn't their best language, they can't give the child that really good vocabulary and the good sentence structure that we need them to have in whatever language. Mm. But if they use their home language, whatever language, whether it's Spanish or Vietnamese or Greek or whatever, if they've got that as their first language, that's the best thing they can do because the second language will come. For some families, they'll actually be two languages from birth. So mum might always speak Spanish and dad might always speak English. And that's fine too, because kids can learn that either at the same time or sequentially. So I guess that's the first thing that I would definitely say, don't be afraid of using home language. Now I can tell you from personal experience, it's almost impossible to learn a second language as an adult. I'm so <laughs> used to those CDs. Yeah, anyway, forget it all about it. Forget it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kids uh, we've, got, do it. we've got a comment from Trish, who has been a teacher for 50 years, um, and she's now a grandma, so congratulations, Trish. Um, but she, she asks, um, are teachers aware of the need to develop language in terms of lessons online? I homeschool my children two days a week, busy, non-purposeful work with little thought to this critical, critical aspect of learning. I'm not sure if that's a thing I read it out. I'm not sure what... Hmm. Well, I'm sure teachers are aware. So I'm, yeah. I think it's it's incredibly challenging, I think, for teachers to manage those conversations. We know how hard it is with you know three or four people on a Zoom, let alone 30 kids on Zoom. I think that is probably really challenging at the moment for yeah. teachers. Um, you know, I think speech uh, teachers are um, increasingly aware of language development. Um, and Natalie, I'm, I'm sure you've got um, more there. Um, they know that language is important for literacy as well. And that's something that is a big focus at the moment um, and, and increasingly so, wouldn't you say that? Yeah, I reckon so, because the importance of early language and early literacy is is becoming, people are becoming more and more aware of that. Um, I've just, last week I've noticed that the um, proposed national early literacy, early language and literacy strategy has been, been published. Um, so that's really, um, here we go, let me show you. Oh, you maybe can't, can't see. see it. Can't no. see, can't see. There it is. Oh, yeah. anyway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And, and it is, if you can download that, uh, you know, or have a look at it, it's really quite interesting and, and telling. So, you know, uh, there's over one in five um, Aussie kids are not developmentally on track with their communication skills at school entry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have trouble understanding or being understood. Um, and, and nearly one in six Aussie kids are not developmentally on track with their language and cognitive skills at school entry. So, you know, often unable to, you know, work out sounds to letters, write simple words, remember things, counting, um, recognising and comparing numbers. And I'm sure teachers on the ground know this too, right? They've, they see in their communities the impact of um, <clears throat> these early language and literacy difficulties you know, and, and I think that, um, you know, working together, we could really make a, um, a big improvement in oral language skills and how important those skills are as foundation skills for later literacy development. So we've got a few questions coming through about older children, but just before we, we answer those ones, yep. I wanted to, um, since we're on the, the, the focus of um, children entering school, I wanted to talk about the role of childcare because childcare centres, when you talk about play and you talk about socialization that sounds like childcare would have a, a huge impact um natalie what, what's your understanding of the role of childcare oh it's fantastic it's a fantastic um environment to immerse kids in um you know they're, they're, we're advocating um uh, for kids that have at least two years before they start school so from three to have childcare uh, access to um, quality childcare um, because childcare centres offer really good quality emotional support for kids um kids feel safe in in childcare centres um and, and it's just a great environment. They offer a lovely structure and, and opportunities for learning. Um, but one area that I think we need more development in is how um, educators can provide quality instructional language um, to kids across all the uh, aspects of development in terms, in terms of language. So providing quality instructions, providing really good vocabulary exposure, explaining concepts. Um, 
because the training, um, the training that uh, early childhood educators receive uh, is not a lot about language speech and language development. And we'd really like to see uh, an improvement in the professional development and coaching and training that um, can be offered to the early childhood education and care con you know, context. Um, I've been working with some researchers at UCID and um, providing, um, partnering with um, early child care centres and providing coaching and training to early childhood educators. Um, and we found that after the, um, pr this providing this program that educators' frequency and confidence of, or well, first of all, increasing their confidence in, in um, understanding the importance of communication, but also increasing the frequency of the good quality interaction skills that um, we know that promote language development. And we also noticed that um, the kids that receive the, when the educators receive this training, the kids actually improved in their ability to retell stories and, and make and, and narratives. And that's really good because you want to see kids being able to use com and combine sentences and to be retail, retail experiences before they start school because there's a relationship between um, early narrative ability and later literacy skills. So if you can relate um, those experiences, it's really quite important. Um, so, and, and we've also been working with um, some childcare centres in Western Sydney um, in the Cumberland LGA as well. And, and matching children, um, we, uh, educators with uh, children who, who share the same languages or share two languages, two common languages. No. Um, and that's just really, really important for um, giving them the best opportunity before they start school. So, I, I mean, the, the, the irony of this is we are talking about COVID and isolation. Yeah. And most, <laughs> you know, most kids are not um, going to childcare, or there are some, mm -hmm. but um, for those that aren't, what, are there resources about the things that you're talking about that parents can access to try and uh, engage in some of that instructional play? Um, do you want to talk about, you mean like play at home, Adam? Is that? I know the sorts of things that you're talking about, early childhood educators in childcare settings, is there, and you're saying early, uh, in early childcare centres yep. um, that people need training uh, in instructional language. Yeah. Uh, is there a way that parents can get access to that information? Um, I think I think more broadly speaking, it would probably be helpful for parents to kind of look for um, childcare cent centres or look for staff within those centres that that have um, that provide opportunities and promote and promote communication. So things like. Um, you know, do they have an environment that promotes adult-child interaction, adult-child conversations, or, and also peer-to-peer -peer conversations? You know, do they have a book corner? Do they have like a literacy corner? Um, do they have like a pretend play area? Yeah. Um, instead of ha having all just unstructured kind of play opportunities for the kids, do they have also some structured, you know, t uh, circle time activities as well? Um, I think those kind of opportunities and, and talking to... Um, talking to the centre and saying, you know, if I, if I did have a child that had a speech or language difficulty, I could say to the centre, well, what sort of training has your staff received in speech, language and communication needs, you know? Um, yeah. are, are you guys willing to kind of, you know, receive extra training on that? That's that's a fair question for, a, you know, for a parent to, to ask. Um, you know, how it's it's about communicating that my kid has extra speech language, you know, communication needs. And, and do all the educators know that? It, not only just the teacher in the room, but the teacher, the early child care um, educator at lunchtime, right? Or the, the, um, the staff in the office, because everybody in that centre, the more that they know, right, then, then everyone can be consistent in the strategies that support these kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like the use of visuals, you know, there could be things like, um, you know, visuals like the structure of the day. Um, are there lots of words printed around the room? Because um, yeah. uh, if you want to improve kids' comprehension, you can have um, pictures um, attached with the words and, that, that, and then you can use your language as well. And all of that will help children comprehend and understand the routines and what's happening in preschool. Right. Yeah. yeah, you've just given lots of strategies that parents could actually take into the home. So yeah. thank you very, very much. Rebecca, can I ask you, we had this question around um, thinking about school age children. Yeah. Um, how do you spot if your child's having literacy based issues, which can be addressed or supported by speech therapy? Uh, 
and also had, I guess, around that, when has speech and language developed well? Um, yeah. Many parents and teachers don't seem to know about this, and those issues can some, sometimes be attributed to other things. This is such an interesting question because um, it is something that we do see. And so we'll sometimes see those kids who, you know, they can talk and they can listen and they've got friends, but they get to this tricky point in language development and reading development where um, you switch over from learning to read, which is the focus of, you know, kinder to year two, um, a little bit of year three, but by year three, you have to then read to learn. And so you need to be really good already at, um, you know, decoding words and understanding the meaning of words and comprehending what you read. And what we sometimes see is that subtle language difficulties can really be missed at that age. They'll have enough language to get by. But by the time things start getting really complex in terms of language and social skills at year three or even year two, mm. um, the language isn't quite good enough. And so sometimes what we'll see um, are kids where there's a subtle underlying language problem and it's not like they can't talk. These kids will be talking and they'll be on the footy field or they'll be running around with friends. But when you assess them and when you look at what they can really do with their language and what they can really understand, we often see a bit of a gap and often that will go with the literacy difficulty. Sometimes we'll see other things that are contributing to literacy problems as well. Um, sometimes, you know, kids might have attention difficulties or they're highly, highly anxious. And so the whole process of learning is really disrupted and there's a language problem on top of that. So we'll often see yeah. that all those things go together. Um, but they can be missed because some kids are just great at kind of, you know, hiding in plain sight. Um, but what teachers and parents can do is look at those issues together understand where there's any um, instructional gaps. So have they actually been taught to decode? Did they catch on when, you know, the, the letter B makes a B sound and if we put B and R and S together, does it make bus? You know, have they actually got that? So sometimes speech pathology can help with that, um, but definitely working in tangent with the school. Sometimes speech pathology can help with um, really developing that oral language and some of those more complex concepts, particularly around understanding what they're reading. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a fantastic question that was put up there. Okay. How do you know if your child is school ready? Ooh. That's a good question. It is a good one. I, yeah, unfortunately the yeah. name didn't get that. I can't give you a star, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, from a, from a language point of view, um, you know, that they're speaking in, in good sentences, you know, re reasonably well, that they could be understood, um, that they can retell stories or retell events. Um, because if something happens at school and, you know, you'd like to think that your kid can be able to tell, you know, the teacher in the playground that something's happened. Um, and from socially, you know, um, that they're interacting with other kids, um, they don't necessarily call, have to call them a friend per se, but they like to hang out with other kids as well. I don't know, Beck. what, what else yeah. are your thoughts oh, about look, that? I think they're really good ones. Um, there's lots of practical things, you know, that I know that early childhood teachers and kindy teachers focus on, like, can they open their lunchbox? Can they identify their own stuff? Lots of those things that you'll know about. I guess one of the things to remember is that actually kids have to go to school by a certain date. And so mm -hmm. if your child is having to start school, and there's no choice about it because they're turning six that year um, and they're still having speech and language problems, then um, they still have to start school, but there's lots that, you know, they can be supported with and the school can help to support um, as long as the school knows what they're looking for. So keep that communication going with the school, keep it going with the educators. I think, I don't know about you, Nat, but I think um, preschool teachers and early childhood teachers are fantastic at knowing which kids you know, might be ready for an early jump and which kids might benefit from another year. And a lot of it will be the social, emotional mm. and communication rather than, and definitely not worried about, you know, can they do maths yet or can they read the books yet? It's about where are their social, emotional and communication skills. Yeah, that's a really good Lily. point, Rebecca. I, I was, uh, you know, when I was, when my kids were starting school, I was so worried about their academic, like not, yeah. not their performance, but are they, are they where they need to be? But particularly when you're a first time parent, yeah. and you're, you know, I'm not sure I was teaching the timetables, but I was, I was doing something <laughs> equivalent, you know, just like, oh, are you ready? You know, like, and then, um, but what I've realised now that I've had um, a few of them go to school and you know, 
have you know various successes and failures in terms of you know development um you realize that actually uh, it's the emotional and social and emotion regulation stuff yep. which is actually I, I think much more crucial than the academic side of it yeah oh absolutely yeah, yeah. okay uh now i'm sorry i've got to go back up i'm in uh so we've got um a question here. i'm a i think a speech pathologist in disability yep. With a number of non-verbal early requesters, um, four to five-year-old clients, some families may have jumped on today. We are looking to get some specific activities and strategies. Example: self-talk and uh, parallel talk. Yeah, great. Um, this is a great question. Um, this is, um, you know, these are the kids that I've certainly worked with a lot. And um, early requester is a great way of describing kids who are just starting to get the idea of making a connection with somebody else in order to get their needs met. And it might be that they're using words or it might be that they're using um, intentional behaviours that help the child get a message to the parent, like I want something or I like something or, you know, I want your company or I want you to keep doing things. Um, and, you know, things like self-talk and parallel talk, these are all things that parents um, can do. And this is what Nat was talking about earlier. Nat, you might want to jump in. But this idea of we keep conversation, we keep that talking going. I, a lot of parents on here will be sick of the sound of their own voice. They might be sick of the same conversations by now because it's been a long time that we've all been stuck at home. But this stuff is still really fantastic. Just narrating your day. This is what I'm doing now. I'm washing up the blue cups. Now I'm washing up the red cup oh, look, the sun's out, it's shiny, we go for a walk, let's look for all the shiny things today, and oh, here's a shiny piece of glass, and oh, there's a shiny puddle. That sort of self-talk and parallel talk where, as Nat was saying before, about repeating the vocabulary and exposing the kids, giving them gaps where they can say things is really important as well, providing those opportunities to make a request or providing an opportunity to make a comment and building on what the child says, um, yeah. These are all strategies that parents can absolutely be using um, just all the time because they may, they do help. Great. And we'll put some of those in the chat um, in terms of resources for you to read through. We've got another question here from Emma, which is, I'm a parent of two children with disabilities. I'm particularly interested in AAC with nonverbal teens who are not able to access regular speech therapy. Telehealth is too challenging as my daughter has severe and profound intellectual disability. Yeah, um, I have been a chat telehealth with that one. Um, so that's where a lot of my research has been. Um, look, telehealth is fantastic. And if telehealth is offered, there's lots of great things that it can do. But it's not for every single population in a way that you'd sit a child in front of the computer. You're not going to do that with two-year-olds, telehealth. Um, and it sounds like for this person, that's not where their daughter's interests are or where her, her interests would be. Um, in this case, really, if telehealth is being used, it should be something that is really um, parent-mediated. And we know that there's good evidence for parent-mediated. So when you know the speech pathologist teaches the parent or helps the parent or coaches them through activities or interactions with their child, and that's true for some um, AAC. So AAC stands for Mentative and Alternative Communication, and that might be sign language, you know, using signs to help someone talk or understand it might be using a device it might be using pictures to make requests or point to something interesting lots of different ways to do that um, and there's good research around that for um, you know with telehealth but it's not that you know the child should be sitting in front of the computer for 45 minutes as if they're at speech pathology it would be much more around okay um, I don't know sorry I'm so sorry I didn't catch uh the name of the person who's doing that, maybe Emma was it? He was asking that question. Okay, Emma, this is what we want to try. This is what we've got. I'm going to post something out to you or here's something I want you to print off. Let's try this. Okay, let's set up some communication temptations. Let's see how that works for your daughter. Let's see what happens with this push button. And it would be very much about um, the speech pathologist working with the mum, the dad, the grandma, the aunt, whoever's with that person with that child and and working on those um, strategies with them. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Sitting in front of a computer for telehealth speech pathology is not going to be ideal for that person. Yeah, and I think that um, the telehealth is playing a major role in services. I know you're oh, yeah. your research, 
But one of the things that you've been a trailblazer in is showing the value of telehealth for public health systems and delivering to rural areas and country and remote. Yeah. Yeah, Isn't this is something that we were researching before COVID hit, actually, Adam. How do we reach underserved populations? So if you're sitting in um, Burke and there's no speech pathologist there, how do you get the services that you need? And so we've looked um, in our team about doing assessments, you know, via telehealth, and there's lots of good research about um, doing all kinds of intervention. It's got, it's got good efficacy. So an assessment that you can do online, um, will have the same results as someone doing it face to face with the caveat that not every kid is going to get all of the benefits all of the time so we just need to think about which kid and how we do that is it parent mediated or is it just straight in front of the computer different ways for different kids so if you are sort of sitting in Burke or you are um, you know even in Sydney right at the moment how, how does one go about getting a telehealth appointment no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm having lots of turns here, but um, most most practitioners at the moment are offering telehealth, almost everyone. I can't think of any services that aren't doing telehealth of some sort at the moment, be it public or private. Um, with COVID, everyone is suddenly a telehealth specialist. Mm -hmm. There's also um, some services around that just specialise in doing telehealth. So they'll, they'll have an office in wherever their office is and all they do is telehealth and they can do that whether you're on Norfolk Island or in, the, um, you know, in literally in the back of Burke, um, there's lots of different ways. But um, you know, university clinics are even doing that now, um, and lots of private practitioners all over the place. So and in terms it's, of it's, the public, the public sector, yeah, yeah, the public sector is um, in different places. Um, the challenge with public sector is that waiting lists are always really big and they'll still have geographical boundaries. I would imagine that if you are not in the catchment for that service, then you'll need to mm. use the catchment where you are. So that's probably a little bit trickier. Yeah, okay, thanks, Rebecca. Um, I think we have answered all the questions and uh, you've given us, oh, hang on, there's, an, there's another one. Here we go. We discussed this, if you're the mental health one, we got very passionate about waiting lists. Um, What's your advice for getting into a service? I mean, this is the ultimate question at the moment. And if government, if anyone's got a, uh, you know, a bucket of money, you know, we need more people trained. We need, I mean, it's crazy. Universities are getting funding cut and yet we have a massive uh, under shortage of um, health professionals. But what is the best way to... Um, get into services at the moment. Any tips? You take it away, Nat. Oh, <laughs> I'm frustrated by the waiting lists um, because there's, and I, I'm from a parent, it, I can really empathise about, you know, if you've got parental concern and, and you really want to get some advice, um, I, I would definitely keep your kid on the waiting list um, and, and be one of those active kind of callers that every three months or so just check that, um, that your child's still on the, still on the list. Um, cancellation appointments might, be, might pop up. Um, Student-run um, speech pathology clinics might offer um, a, an alternative um, opportunity for, for families as well. There's also, um, Beck and I were talking about NGOs that provide like um, drop-in kind of services where you can just um, come in and have a chat to a speech pathologist about communication and, and, and speech and language. Um, uh, in, in, in early childhood um, education and care set, settings as well, they um, might provide opportunities for allied health um, into, you know, therapists to come into their centre as well. They might have a relationship with an existing service. Um, Beck, is there anything other else? That yeah, you I, to... I think they're the main ones um, to think about. Um, but you know, it's okay to um, hop onto a few waiting lists because sometimes you know one service might suddenly open up. Private practices are always employing as much as they, you know, as fast as they can, as fast as we can produce yeah. graduates, they're employing them. Um, uh, Emhe has made a good point that for some families, they can get a, um, a chronic disease management plan from GPs to help support the cost of private therapy. Um, you know, that's it's not all of the cost, but it can be helpful. Um, but I'd agree that student clinics. So look at where universities um, teach student speech pathologists and contact them to see. And there's four or five unis in Sydney, plus um, you know, Canberra, Newcastle, Albury, 
all over the place. So definitely worth checking out those two. I think, um, you know, taking from the, you know, all health, it has huge waiting lists at the moment. Yeah. Partly because I know in the public sector, um, all sorts of allied health have been shifted into roles. We're just talking about how many speech pathologists are now involved in vaccination centres. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, the, you know, the, the, the workforce really has um, changed and um, because yeah, of the... It's a bit tricky at the moment. It is tricky. But, you know, I, I, having um, have, had to navigate the system um, myself and for, for other people, um, you cannot underplay... The importance of persistence and you know making um, many phone calls and um, you know I, I think there are gaps if, if you're persistent um, but it, you've, you've got to really work hard and you've got to advocate for you and your and your child um, okay are, are there any other comments from the listeners before we finish up i think you've answered just about everything and that and uh no, we've just more there's more parenting tips Coming through. Thanks, Johanna, who's behind the scenes supporting us. We found a lot of resources. We're hoping that parents will, you know, have a chance to, you know, click on these links and, and see what's relevant for, for their family and their context. Um, you know. A lot of the ones about play are popping up at the moment. And I think that's something that um, we've just, we touched on a little bit, but just yeah, let's talk about out, play. That's yeah, just trying to figure out new ways to way. um, play and, and engage with kids. Because I think, you know, at this stage we might be a little bit over play. Um, and for some parents, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that playing with three and four or six-year-olds doesn't come naturally. And it might be that comfortable for some parents. Um, but there's different types of play, Ben. There's you know? different types Bear. of play. Absolutely. And so use your interest use your skills and see what you can bring to play remembering that kids develop different stages of play so we don't expect two-year-olds to play superheroes or you know imagine things but you know at four or five we might kids might really love doing lots of that role play and you might see them acting out schools or acting out um, you know princesses and pirates or having fun with that and the kids will have much better imagination than you will. So go with them. <laughs> if they suggest that, you know, they're a pirate and you'd be the princess dad, then really I think if we can follow their lead, we'll get a lot of fun out of that. And um, remembering that you don't need all the toys really mm-hmm. is probably the other thing. Um, you know, kids, toys are great, toys are fun. But if you've got a parent, parents are much more fun if you can get all the you know, get all the bits of junk out of the shed or, you know, find what's in the bottom of the pantry and, um, you know, with the pots and pans or lots of different ways we can have fun and and really encourage that imaginary play. So we're putting lots of, um, you know, different imaginary play and symbolic play um, activities up there for parents. Yeah, I just realised we did get an email from a, um, a listener um before the session and i forgot to ask the question about the impact of face masks uh on language development and we'll talk about a bit about it in social development but it's related yeah um, did you want to i don't have the full question i was just trying to find it um but um did you want to i'll tell you an interesting observation that my 11 year old said to me we were going for a walk and um we you know we noticed that because of social distancing people walk past with the masks right and and everyone kind of <laughs> it moves away from from people, yeah. and um, and she said to me, you know, Mum, is is it is this social distancing or or are they just avoiding me? You know, yeah. and um and I said I, I said because you've got you've only got the eyes, and and really a lot of nonverbal communication comes from the the mouth and the fa- and the whole face. Mm-hmm. You know, your Apple iPhone won't show your ID. You won't pop up when you've got a mask on. So if that's happening for your Apple I- your Apple phone, <laughs> what's happening for communication, right? We must be yeah. breaking down in terms of not working out, you know, what, what I'm actually revealing with my nonverbal facial expressions and things. And I, I kind of said to her that um, it's almost like the, the social aspects of communication are, are, are not are impacted right and and it's not about avoidance it's not social it's not avoiding as in we don't like you um it's it's a safe thing from you know from a health perspective and not catching you know a a virus a a airborne virus sort of thing and and um 
if, she, if she's reflecting on that, then I think, you know, there's probably other kids that are kind of work, trying to work this stuff out too. Um, and and um, I think that it's important to have that kind of conversation, you know, with your kid and say, it's, you know, darling, it's okay. It's, um, it's just you can't see with the mouth, with the mask on at the moment. But, you know, look yeah. at the eyes and listen to what they say um, and, and that will all help. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, actually, so our next um, session on uh, Mondays with Nadia Badawi and Associate Professor John <laughs> Keogh and Professor Badawi, I should say. And um, they, um, they're going to be talking about pregnancy and also uh, care of infants when they're uh, first born in hospital settings. Nadia is actually going to talk about um, early life development and the impact she's noticed um, with face masks on on babies. So that's going to be on Monday night. And um, yeah. in, in a future sem seminar in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about social development. Mm. And then um, I'll also, there's also uh, with the transition of kids going back to school mm. and going back to social settings, um, there is going to be um, I don't, I'm a, <laughs> a significant increase in social anxiety and shyness mm. other than is, and uncomfortability and venturing out. And so we'll be having a seminar on that later um in the coming weeks yeah can i just uh, mention adam yeah. that um if kids if kids are coming uh with you know anxiety or um uh other kind of behavior concerns um a lot of kids that have these kind of behavioral emotional um concerns and and um um, disorders they are at high risk of having a language disorder themselves and sometimes it's not identified and so if if um if your child is presenting with behavioral you know concerns and difficulties then then do think about your child's language skills as well not just about the behavior because sometimes the language is um the skills are underlying and, and not not visible um and also the con the flip side of that is that kids that do have um speech and language difficulties, they too are at risk of having behavioural difficulties as well um, from the consequences of, of having communication difficulties. And so I kind of really like the fact that, you know, think about it as a holistic kind of, you know, approach where, you know, if it's a um, um, behaviour as well as language and communication, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, now, there's just another comment about the paper you were talking about, if you can, I'm not sure how quickly you can access it. Yeah, it's the first one um, that was posted. Oh. Uh, okay. The second one, the second one okay. in the chat. All right, that was the one where, where, where you use the word in a different uh -huh. um, structure. Yep. Yeah, and a lot of, uh, um, a lot of the other resources um, offer some practical suggestions as well about um, providing good quality, you know, language input to kids. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So thanks, Jocelyn. I think so thanks, awesome. uh, everyone. As I said, on Monday, we'll be talking about um, pregnancy and um, uh, babies in, when they're first born in the hospital. And we, we've got uh, Nadia Badawi and uh, John Keogh. And then on Wednesday, uh, next week, we have two school principals, actually, Great. from Stanmore and also in uh, Canterbury LGA to come on to talk about um, uh, school systems and supporting kids at home. So um, that's going to be fun. Now, if, ever, if anything, there's capacity building there, right? Speeches and teachers working together, awesome. Well, actually, you know, across all of this, I think one of the big lessons, I know we have to wrap up, but one yeah, of the big lessons that we're learning from this is integration, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's mental health, whether yeah. it's education, whether it's allied health, it's it's all, we are, we're recognising a massive need, particularly during social isolation, to work together to try and get through this. And uh, I mean, not in a yeah. sort of a, a, a statement kind of way, but, we're trying to outline practical strategies where we can work together. So um, yep. totally. thanks everyone. This has been really good. Natalie, Rebecca, you're just geniuses and I'm so pleased you came on and I'll um, look forward to hanging out with you guys after this. See you later. Bye. Thanks, Adam. Thanks everyone. See you later, everyone. Thanks. Take care.